So if you want to study genetics in humans instead of in model organisms, you rapidly run up against several problems. First, while Mendel could gather hundreds or even thousands of seeds from each plant, human families are small, right? Most parents only have several offspring. And second, unless you're being really unethical, you can't direct the breeding of humans, right? So no back crosses, no test crosses, no experimental breeding of any kind. And so what that means is that human genetics is purely observational. And the usual way of representing genetic data about a group of related humans is with a pedigree chart. The basic symbols are a square for a male, a circle for a female, and if we're studying a trait or more commonly a, a, a heritable disease, then an individual that is affected will have a filled in symbol. So consider, for example, this pedigree right here. A mating is uh, uh, written down as a horizontal line between two symbols, and we use the Roman numerals to indicate generation, and the Arabic numerals to represent the siblings or the individuals within a generation. Now, your book has a set of rules to help you determine if a pedigree is showing a dominant or a recessive trait. And if that's helpful for you, I encourage you to use it. I find it more useful to simply assume one or the other, a dominant trait or a recessive trait, and then ask if the data we're looking at is possible given that assumption. For example, let's assume that this pedigree is for a dominant trait, and let's call that gene D. Then the dominant homozygote and the heterozygote are affected, and the recessive homozygote is unaffected. Is this possible? Well, individuals I1 and I2 are both unaffected, so they must both have the genotype little d, little d, right? They must both be homozygous recessive, but they have an affected child. And so this child has to be big D, big D, or big D, little d, right? And if we don't know what the allele is, we just put an underline there to indicate that. And this isn't a possibility, because where would that big D allele have come from, right? It didn't come from either of those two parents. If instead we assume that this disease is a recessive genetic trait, then the homozygote dominant and the, homo and the heterozygote are both unaffected, and the homozygote recessive is affected. And if we return to the same three individuals for this pedigree, now we know that the genotype for individual generation two, individual two here, is little d, little d, right? They were affected. They had to have the homozygous recessive genotype. And these two individuals could have been heterozygotes both. And they both could have contributed that little d allele to this offspring. So it's probably a recessive trait, right? This data is consistent with this um, heritable disease having been recessive, more so than with a dominant trait. And so one of the reasons that human genetics is hard is that most traits aren't Mendelian, right? There are a few diseases, of course, that show Mendelian inheritance, but really it was only with the advent of modern molecular methods that we could really start to connect genotype and phenotype at a large scale. And a huge amount of this semester is going to be devoted to just that question. But before we leave Mendelian genetics, we need to have a look at some traits that aren't strictly Mendelian. First, a molecular look and then a probabilistic one.